Okay, I think we can get started. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. My name is Hallie Perlick, and I will be the technical manager for this session on driving behavior change for better complementary feeding, chaired by Kelsey Torres. Thank you for taking part in ANH 2021, and we look forward to a robust and interactive session today. Just a quick reminder that everything you might need to access the conference materials and program can be found on our ANH Academy website at anh-academy.org slash ANH2021. Before Kelsey takes this conversation forward, I just had a few small technical announcements to ensure our experience is as smooth as possible. So first, this session is being recorded and will be posted on the ANH Academy website following the conference. All participants have been muted, but please introduce yourselves using the chat function. Let us know your name, where you're joining us from, and the organization that you work with. We encourage you to share your webcam video feed during this session, but if your connection isn't great, we recommend turning your video off. Later in the session, we will open up with a Q&A. If you have any questions, we invite you to share them in the chat box throughout the session. Last, if at any point you experience technical issues, please first check your audio settings and your internet connection. You can always reconnect to this session using the same Zoom link you used to be here today. If you have a technical question, please feel free to send me a direct message in the chat box. Great, thanks so much. And I'll pass it over to you, Kelsey. Thanks, Sally. Um, great. Thank you all for joining our session today on driving behavior change for better children's diets during the complementary feeding period. I'm just going to turn off my video since I'll be sharing slides. Um, here we go. So first I would like to introduce our speakers. My name is Kelsey Torres and I am a technical specialist with USAID Advancing Nutrition. I support the project's social and behavior change team and the nutrition and health systems team. And I also lead activities related to improving quality SBC processes. Next, we have Laura Itzkowitz. Laura is a nutrition, social and behavior change advisor with the USAID Bureau for Global Health. Laura has spent over 10 years working on SBC community health and nutrition across three continents with USAID in various international organizations. Ashima Garg works as a nutrition specialist with UNICEF headquarters in New York. With over 15 years of progressive experience in maternal and child nutrition across Asia, Africa, and the Middle East, she leads the programming for improving young children's diets during the complementary feeding period and provides technical guidance and support to UNICEF regional and country offices. And finally, Silver Karumba serves as the nutrition specialist for USAID Rwanda, and he sits in the health office. He has extensive experience designing, implementing, and managing multi-sectoral nutrition and ECD interventions. He also has significant experience coordinating and collaborating with development partners in the government of Rwanda. Today, we will start with a brief introduction to complementary feeding. Then Ashima will share the UNICEF action framework to improve the diets of young children during the complementary feeding period. Next, Laura will walk us through the steps for quality SBC to improve children's diets, which will include a couple rounds of breakout rooms to practice some of the key steps using mock scenarios. After, Silver will share programming experiences in Rwanda related to SBC for improving children's diets. And finally, we will have an open question and answer session. Please add your questions to the chat throughout the session and we will address them during that time. So I'd like to kick off this session hearing from you all about your experience working to improve children's diets. Um, Hallie, if you could please launch the poll. Um, you should see a poll pop up on your screen. And if you could kindly select yes, some, or no, if you have experience, some experience, or if you do not have experience. And we'll just give it a few seconds. Looks like we have pretty balance between yes and some and a few no's. It's great to have all of you here. Okay, great. So it looks like um, mostly everyone has um, some experience. So um, that's wonderful. And if you don't, no problem at all. This session hopefully will still be relevant as we um, talk about quality SBC processes that can apply to other behaviors. Um, so next, um, I just want to ask those of you who do have some experience working to improve children's diets, 
please type in the chat what was or what is most challenging about it. And don't be shy, feel free to just jump in. Okay, we have one response saying variety, diversity of diets, access to quality foods, traditional beliefs, great, cultural values, changing perceptions. Wow, some great responses. Yeah, lots. So um, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna move along, but um, I really appreciate your contributions in the chat. And as we can all see and testify to that it's, it's very challenging. Um, so that's um, moving into our session today. Hopefully um, these resources that we share can, can help make it a little easier. The complementary pe uh, feeding period from six to 23 months of age is one of the most challenging times to meet children's nutrient demands. While children's stomachs can only hold a small amount of food, their nutrient needs reach a lifetime peak. Appropriate complementary feeding is often thought of as a single behavior. However, it actually requires many behaviors that change with the child's age. These behaviors must be practiced together in the right balance over the six to 23 month period. How caregivers carry out each behavior is influenced by multiple factors across households, communities, and systems. These factors, along with the people who influence them, may also be different for each behavior. People who work in health, food, water, sanitation and hygiene, and social protection systems all have a role in making it easier for caregivers to feed children what they need. What we do matters. No matter what sector, behaviors are the root of nutrition for children. Whether the policymaker, the farmer, the health worker, or the caregiver, the tree and the nutrition program grows from the roots. Behaviors are important at all levels and systems for children's diets. We often think of feeding practices, but in this session, we will get into all of the systems for a holistic approach to improving diets. People are complex. Contexts are all different. This is why we need quality social and behavior change that engages all of the various people across sectors who have a role to play in improving children's diets. So now I will hand it over to Ashima, who will share UNICEF's programming approach to improve children's diets in the complementary feeding period. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. And um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Very happy to be part of uh, this uh, session. And I was smiling as I was reading uh, some of the responses which you were giving. So perhaps, as Kelsey says, hopefully by the end of the session, you feel more inspired and more aware about how you can approach those, those challenges. And for in this regard, I will share with you a UNICEF's programming approach, uh, which we have developed over the last three years of how we can make the first foods during complementary feeding period count. Uh, so Kelsey, if you could please go to the next slide. So I would like to start by reminding um, or stating uh, a dream, which I would envision as a shared dream, a dream uh, to make every bite a young child eats count every child everywhere. This is this seems simple, but the people who have been working in this area, they know it's not that simple achieving this dream. As during the complementary feeding period, a, ch a young child needs to be fed with nutritious, safe, age appropriate foods while providing her with nurturing care and continued breastfeeding. And realizing this dream of making every bite count for every child is, of critical importance for us because, next please, Kelsey, uh, because it is important for our children to grow, develop, learn, and reach their full potential also for prevention of all forms of malnutrition. Next please. Yet this dream, I will say, when we look at the global data and statistics, this dream is not being realized because the global data shows us that fewer than one in three children eat food from minimum number of food groups. This is an indicator which we use to uh, measure the quality of children's diets. It's called as minimum dietary diversity. And not just this figure, if we go further, the situation varies across regions and countries, and it gets worse with child's place of residence and wealth status of the household. 
Now, the question which um, which we need to think at this point, looking at the global global data, is we have been implementing programs to improve complementary feeding practices or program in the past decade, but then why are we not making the desired progress? Because this figure hasn't changed over the last decade. If you we have done a trend analysis and we see there is hardly any progress in this figure over the last decade. Next, please, Kelsey. So when we do a review of programming evidence, um, which to assess what we have been doing over the last decade, we see that programs to improve the diets of young children are not often designed and implemented effectively. As Kelsey also mentioned, um, it, in our efforts have gone more towards improving complementary feeding practices, but not complemented together with improving the quality of children's food. And that leads to, if we look at the kind of interventions which we are doing, our efforts have been more scattered, standalone, siloed, and often not grounded in sound situation analysis. And that is, I'm saying when we have done this analysis across regions and countries, um, and this is a common trend which we have found. So the next question for us to think is, what is required from our programs to be effective for improving young children's diets? Because we have been doing some interventions here and there. So next please. Um, the two requirements, which I call as core principles or requirements for designing and implementing program for young children's diets. The first one is our programs need to address all the determinants and drivers of young children's diets. Next please, Kelsey. So when we talk about a uh, young diet, a uh, good diet for young children, there are three conditions which are the determinants of children's diets. That is adequate foods, adequate services, and adequate practices. These are the three conditions which need to be fulfilled in order for a young child to have a good diet. You may try to see whatever you were mentioning in your poll, next please, Kelsey, all these three determinants are driven by some contextual factors, which we call as drivers. And if you will, you may find what you were mentioning, you can map it out on this slide, the challenges or the drivers which you mentioned. For example, adequacy of complementary foods is driven by their availability, their access, their affordability and desirability. Similarly, these, uh, you can think about the adequate foods, but also adequate services and practices. So this is just to give you a sense that whenever we design our program, first requirement is, is to get a good understanding of what these drivers and determinants are. Second, next please. The second key requirement for our programs is to deliver the evidence-based interventions at scale and equity. We all have gone through 10, 10 essential interventions, the Lancet released recent uh, set of interventions, and somewhere or the other, we have come to a good level of evidence to say with confidence that what works for improving children's diets. However, that needs to be delivered and scale and to every child. So the four, I, I tried to club the evidence-based intervention into four kind of themes. First is we need to work on promoting the access to and use of nutritious, safe, diverse, affordable local foods or foods which are available in context. Where needed, where we know that the diets are uh, not nutrient rich, we need to provide multiple micronutrient powders or comp fortified complementary foods, or to some extent, invest in large scale food fortification where applicable. Then we also need to work around strengthening the adoption and enforcement of legislations to regulate marketing of unhealthy foods and beverages, as some of you also mentioned that as a critical driver. And finally, which is, which ties it all together is working on behaviors through counseling and multi-channel uh, social and behavior change communication. These are the context specific interventions which we need to deliver, not in isolation, but more so comprehensively. So uh, next please, Kelsey. Based on um, this kind of understanding of these two requirements, what we did, we came up with an action framework. We are calling it action framework to improve the diets of young children, which just reinforces the logic of systematic analysis and systems approach. Because as I said, in order for us to fulfill the first requirement, that is to understand the critical uh, determinants and drivers. So the action framework first says that 
before you design a complementary feeding program or programs to improve diets of young children, do invest time, resources, and energy in understanding the critical gaps, bottlenecks, and barriers across the three conditions, that is the food, services, and practices. Once you have that understanding, the next step would be to prioritize strategic actions. As you will reflect, in order for us to achieve or address gaps and barriers across these three determinants, we would need multiple systems or delivery systems, be it food, health, water and sanitation, and social protection systems. These are the four systems based on the evidence and the uh, delivery platforms that we see are critical for accomplishing the outcome of good diets. And while we design the strategic actions, it is also important, one more click, Kelsey, um, is to define these actions at various levels of influence based on the programming context. That is, define these actions at policy level, at the service delivery level, and at community household or individual level. Because all the barriers which you will assess, you will realize when you tie it to the delivery of actions may not, may, will need a response through multi-system, but also at multi-level and involvement of multiple stakeholders. And that is why working on uh, improving the diets of young children requires concerted efforts from multiple streams of organizations, the government, academe, but also the, the community and the mothers themselves to influence the behavior. Uh, next please, uh, Kelsey. The framework reinforces the importance of several systems uh, in achieving the quality of good diets. We have food systems, which can uh, produce diverse and nutritious foods, uh, but also create a healthy food environment. We need health system with staff at facility and community level to provide counseling and support for optimal complementary feeding. We need water and sanitation systems that provide safe and palatable drinking water, safe sanitation and hygiene services to protect children from nutrient losses. And lastly, but not the least, and the issue of affordability, how can we deal the issue of affordability to make sure we do it with equity, a social protection system, because in many contexts, it provides a social safety net, uh, so social safety net for young children and most vulnerable families and provide us platforms where we can promote nutritious food, essential services and positive feeding practices. So we need to, it's not one system working in isolation, but we need to make sure that we have a synergistic response based on the drivers and determinants which we have identified. Next, please. So now the question comes, uh, which I'm often asked is, do all countries need to use, deliver or work through all four systems at the same time? My answer is yes. Uh, all countries need to prioritize working with systems, all four systems, if you want to accomplish the quality of good diets. However, that uh, you need to do it by defining short, medium, and long-term actions. For that, it is important that we first assess, do the situation analysis and assess the country specific determinants and drivers around the food practices and services. Also assess the programming context, which would mean assess the capacity of systems which you have in the country and see which one would be your first, uh, or I don't wanna use the word low hanging food, but where, which has the highest potential for you to uh, leverage and link other uh, systems and look at the resources and partnership to come up with context specific strategic actions which are delivered through relevant systems. Um, next please. And um, I would say like this is like my final slide where, where I would like to reinforce it's like what is the programming approach which we are trying to reinforce. The four takeaways if you have to take from all the talk 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 which I have done is the approach is about systematic analysis and systems approach. Systematic analysis is important because it helps in operationalizing systems approach. And this action framework gives you a tool to go through the systematic analysis by helping the countries in designing, implementing, and monitoring evidence-based actions. So you start, you always go from left to right and prioritize actions through multiple systems at various levels. And these, uh, um, this action framework could be applied to all four systems as you could see those four plugs down there, what we have tried to do is we have to superimpose this logic to food system, health system, water and sanitation system, and social protection system to help uh, the uh, countries, governments, and other stakeholders to think through 
the same logic if for example a country decides to use food system as a first entry point then you could pick up uh, the actions defined uh, for food systems uh, next please kelsey all this what i have spoken about we have tried to write it up uh, in a programming guidance which is a global narrative for us for protecting and promoting the diet services and practices and it talks about in detail um, about the evidence but also the illustrative actions uh, and going through the systematic approach so this is the link to the guidance uh, and if you have any questions feel free please feel free to reach out to me i will be very happy uh, to be of any support thank you very much and with that i will like to hand it over to laura uh, laura over to you thanks ashima um, so since Ashima has talked about the overall complementary feeding, what we need for it, I'm going to focus in on one of the components she mentioned, um, SBC, by talking about the steps to quality SBC. Next slide, please. So I'm going to tell you about the key steps of quality SBC through a story, and I'm going to mention a number of different tools during this, and one of my colleagues will put the links to them in the chat um, as we go. Um, so start out by imagining a nutrition program that comes about because the local government and USAID see that children's nutrition indicators are not improving after many years and different types of programs. Let's call this program Sprouts. Instead of starting out knowing what activities the program will implement, Sprouts decides to follow these steps to quality nutrition SBC. Prioritize behaviors, design for impact um, by identifying factors and linking pathways and implement and monitor. Next slide, please. So first, the program starts by answering the questions, who needs to do what to solve the problem? Then of these actions, which would make the biggest difference? Next slide. To prioritize behaviors, the Sprouts program reviewed data to find the behaviors that would make the biggest difference to improve the diets of young children. First, they looked at these six globally recommended complementary feeding behaviors identified by the USA Nutrition SBC Working Group. These behaviors have been shown to reduce malnutrition, especially stunting and wasting in young children. Next slide. After an initial prioritization, they narrowed their focus on feeding children six to 23 months old, a variety of age appropriate, safe, diverse, nutrient rich foods. The Sprouts team realized that dietary diversity could be further refined based on the context. For complementary feeding, it is important to identify key practices by age group within the complementary feeding period, since feeding behaviors vary month to month as children grow. The program reviewed data to find the behaviors that would make the biggest difference to improving diet diversity. They found that two specific behaviors were most likely to contribute to improving diet diver dietary diversity and were reasonable to change given the current situation and resources. These behaviors were caregivers feed children six to 23 months old an animal source food each day, and caregivers offer children nine to 12 months old pieces of fruit and vegetables as snacks to feed themselves. After implementing activities focused on these two specific behaviors, the project evaluation found that focusing on the smaller number of behaviors avoided overloading or overwhelming community members, local leaders and programmers, and led to better impact. This example shows that we can do anything, but we cannot do everything, not at the same time at least. So prioritization requires subjective decision making informed by data. DHS or other quantitative data are most useful for this stage. USAID Advanced Nutrition prepared this simple tool to help guide the prioritization process. To start the process, you need to decide on a program goal. For a nutrition-specific program focused on complementary feeding, nutritional status can be used. For nutrition-sensitive programs or areas, it may be another outcome instead of or in addition to nutrition status. For these programs, the tool has a place to note the program outcome. For example, increased access to affordable, safe, nutrient-rich food. There are four main criteria to consider during prioritization. First, it is important to examine the current prevalence of the behavior and how much improvement is needed in order to increase the prevalence to about 80%. This is identified as the behavior gap. Next, based on scientific and epidemiological evidence, we can select behaviors that are closest and will make the biggest difference to the desired outcome. 
In the tool, this is described as potential to impact results. Then, during prioritization, we can examine the feasibility of changing the behavior given available resources, services, and constraints in the program area. This is potential ability to change. And finally, behaviors are prioritized based on how well they fit within the program, based on the project or organization's manageable interests, including time, competencies, and resources needed to promote the practice. The behavior should also align with national and or subnational policy priorities. Next slide, thanks. Um, so the main takeaway to get from this section is that programs should have a list of priority behaviors they want to focus on changing over the life of the project from the very start of the program. Use these prioritized behaviors to focus your formative research. During the formative research, include questions to learn more from participant groups about their willingness and ability to practice the behavior, given their available resources, time, interest, and social support. Following formative research, you should use the findings to update the scoring on the behavior prioritization tool as needed and refine the prioritized behaviors. Then you're ready to design your SVC strategy. So now we're going to split into breakout rooms to practice behavior prioritization using the tool that I shared. Your breakout room facilitator will explain the exercise to you further. So. So hi everyone, welcome back. I hope that all of your breakout rooms had some really good discussion and you got a chance to really see what are the kinds of things that you would be really working out together as a team um, if you did use the behavior prioritization tool at the beginning of your programs and even the things you should be discussing even if you're doing it without the tool. Um, so thank you to everyone for contributing in the groups. So now I'm going to um, continue on with talking about the steps for quality SBC, um, focusing on design for impact. Let's go to the next slide. So we're gonna go back to the Sprouts program that we were imagining earlier. So when we left off, they had narrowed to two behaviors. Caregivers feed children six to 23 months old and animal source food each day and caregivers offer children nine to 12 months old pieces of fruit and vegetables as snacks to feed themselves. Next, the program sought to understand what will make these priority behaviors easier to do by removing barriers or adding supports. This takes us to designing for impact, which includes identifying factors and linking pathways using a behavior profile. Next slide. A behavior profile includes all essential information about a priority behavior in a simple table that you can see at a glance. Together, we will look at one of the behavior profiles that the Sprouts program put together. First, the factors. If you could click, on Kelsey. Thank you. Um, when you look at the example behavior on the screen, you'll see three very different factors that were identified through formative research as having a large impact on the behavior. You can go to the next slide. So as nutrition SBC practitioners, it's important to understand the main barriers and motivators or factors that prevent or support the behaviors we're promoting. This tool is simply a reference list of key factors that influence nutrition behaviors. The factors are organized by structural, social, and internal levels to help think about people in their context. You can use the tool to spot check or guide your thinking on a behavior to ensure that you've explored the wide range of potential factors and are planning an intervention that takes the most influential factors into account. So next slide. The Sprouts program collected existing research on each of the prioritized behaviors. The program held rapid consultations on feeding young children animal source foods and fruits and vegetables to fill the research gaps. They found that increased family support, especially from grandmothers, was needed for all behaviors. The program also identified a need to increase access to affordable fruits and vegetables with market vendors and to strengthen skills um, with caregivers for preparing fruits and vegetables for young children. Go to the next slide, thanks. Um, market vendors, grandmothers, and community agents were the key supporting actors or the people who could support practice of a behavior by reducing a barrier or enhancing a support. 
An important point here is that some factors may link to one or more support to more than one supporting actor or actors, um, and that and that actors will likely be able to influence more than one factor. For example, grandmothers could help shift norms around child feeding and also support caregivers in learning how to prepare fruits and vegetables for children. So it's not just a one-to-one -one match. Instead of coming to the SBC strategy and work plan with activities already planned, the SPARTS program selected and refined activities by creating pathways from the behaviors to factors to activities that will address the most important factors. They looked at what strategic activities really needed, need to be engaged and what systems need to be in place to change the behaviors. It was not a grab bag approach, nor did they just move forward with the activities they had proposed prior to completing the behavior prioritization and formative research since they wanted to have the most effective program they could. For the Sprouts, Sprouts program, Norms around feeding children fruits and vegetables was an important factor. This meant that they emphasized engagement of grandmothers rather than only counseling mothers. Following the pathway in blue, they planned community dialogues and home visits to engage grandmothers in complementary feeding practices and overcome reservations about feeding children fruits and vegetables. The program also set up cooking demonstrations for grandmothers and mothers in the community to learn and practice recipes for feeding children fruits and vegetables. They put more em emphasis than initially expected on working with market vendors, since their analysis of factors showed that these groups played a vital role in increasing access to affordable options of fruits and vegetables, a key factor for improving dietary diversity. The program did these activities because the research showed that they will influence the most important factors, which will lead to achieving their outcome and primary goal. They worked together to make strategic decisions following a clear process with data backing up each, slide, each step. USAID Advanced Nutrition developed another tool to help with this step. This tool is for after prioritization. It can be used during program or activity design to organize and distill research into an evidence-based SBC strategy. It walks you through analyzing the research findings using the different factor domains, structural, social, and internal, refining prioritized behaviors using the research, prioritizing factors and actors, creating linked pathways from the factors to program activities, and developing the SBC strategy. This tool is under revision now and will be posted on our website as soon as it's finalized. Um, the document will also be added to the tool's webpage when it's finalized. We don't have the link just quite yet. So the main message to remember from this section is that each activity should clearly address the factors that influence priority behaviors and programs should be able to show evidence of how their activities link to the prioritized behaviors and their factors. These pathways should be described in the SBC strategy. The strategy serves as a roadmap for which behaviors the project will aim to change, why those behaviors are prioritized, how the project will address the influencing factors, the and the expected results. Activities in the strategy will likely be multi-sectoral and will call upon the various sectors outlined in the action framework that Ashima shared to play a role in improving young children's diets. Next, Ashima will share some videos as examples of activities that may be in your SBC strategy. So I will pass it off to Ashima. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much. So I'll briefly talk about some very exciting uh, videos. As we, as we heard in the last few minutes, the importance of communication. Um, so what we did is this is a series of videos which we developed um, to try to communicate uh, how the, the how of complementary feeding practices. Next, please, uh, Kelsey. So first is who are these videos for? So there are two series. It's a set of 17 videos which are addressed to two um, audiences. One is field level workers. We have nine videos for field level workers which can be used in training. And we have eight videos for mothers and caregivers. The, both the video series are similar in content but they have been designed and edited differently to suit the needs of the target audience. Um, as uh, you, we will see further. Next, please. 
these videos were shot in three different countries. Uh, we tried to make it as relatable as possible to the current programming context. So these were shot in Nepal, Nigeria, and Kenya. Um, we developed these videos in collaboration with Global Health Media Project. Uh, they have amazing videos uh, on other areas as well. And you should visit their website. I should have included their link, but I forgot, but I can share it later. Um, next, please. Uh, what are these videos about? As, as I mentioned, these videos, they showcase the best practices of what, when, and how to feed. These are the three dimensions of complementary feeding. Um, and also the advantage or the what we try to use in these videos is using real home feeding situations to show video series with um, to show through video series what is simple and feasible because as we have been talking about um, the complexity or the uh, I heard it in the group our group I was there it's like what is easy and what is difficult so why the how part of complementary feeding feels difficult. We need to find simple and feasible uh, solutions or how practices can be done. And that's what we have tried to showcase in these videos. Next, please. So I will just uh, take you through the two series. First, as I mentioned, is Mothers and Caregivers series. We have nine videos. As you can see on the right hand side, uh, these are the title of the videos, uh, starting with when to start the child solid food what to feed, then we have tried to do the transition age appropriate feeding with feeding your child from six to 12 months, then one to two years, because there is a difference in the all the dimensions of quality, quantity, consistency, frequency, and how to keep your child's first food safe. So that focuses on uh, hygiene and safe feeding practices and how to feed your child with care, which is focused more around the responsive feeding component. Very interesting video. Um, uh, as well. And lastly, feeding your child during and after illness, it's a, another important component. Uh, in addition, we also have two um, videos focused on breastfeeding for working mothers, because this is again uh, quite interlinked, as it also came in the group discussion, is breastfeeding for working mother and breastfeeding when you go back to work. That is, the continued breastfeeding is an important component of the way we understand feeding young children in six to 23 months. So that's to reiterate that. Um, these videos since are for caregivers, they are targeted to improve the knowledge and taking or addressing the misconceptions around what, when and how to feed the child and also to improve the learning experience during individual and um, uh, group counseling sessions. We have tried to use these videos or we have been using these videos in different contexts. And one of the advantages is uh, Global Health Media has also come up with a, an application so that these videos can be downloaded on phones, tablets, and computers. The good part is if mothers have it on their phone, they can view these as and when needed. So it, it's more like a reinforcement which can be used. Next, please. The second series is the, for the frontline workers. The objective of this series is integration into the existing IVSCF training platform. We, ha we are having countries where they are integrating these videos as part of pre-service um, uh, curricula as well. So that's encouraging to see that. The emphasis is on improving the technical knowledge and, and how to best support the caregivers. So again, you will see there are seven videos are common, but targeted towards the training part that is when to start the food, how to prepare the food, what to feed your child, how much and how often to feed the young child, how to keep the food safe, and how to feed young children with care and feeding during illness. One of the addition to this video series is um, the nutrition counseling visit, which is addressed of how uh, a health worker could use uh, the communication together with uh, the community IVCF counseling packages, which I hope some of you are aware about. That's another great resource, which is a set of counseling cards, which we use to uh, convey and communicate and counsel on infant and young child feeding. So this video, um, I'm going to show this video next, and then you, uh, it's, it's a 10 minutes video that you will see. And um, these videos, 
I see some of the questions flying, which I can see while while I'm talking is um, also that about the language. These videos are available in seven languages, uh, including obviously three local languages for the three countries I mentioned. Um, in fact, for Nigeria, we have three uh, dialects which are there, but these videos have been translated in tons of languages. I have lost even count of because countries are just going and translating it. But major languages, English, French and Spanish, these are available. Um, however, I mean, you, you can just visit Global Health Media website on the links below um, and you will find multiple languages which are there. And if someone or countries can always reach out to us and we are supporting the translation, uh, I mean, we are giving them the scripts so that they can translate if these videos are only to be used for educational purposes, since these have UNICEF copyright. So with that, um, um, I will request Kelsey to play this very interesting video on nutrition counseling. I hope you will enjoy it. Thank you. Thanks, Ashiva. Um, please bear with me. I just need to turn on the audio. I'm so sorry, I forgot to um, set that setting when I shared my screen. The Nutrition Counseling Visit for Young Children All families want their children to grow up healthy. Sometimes though, beliefs, cultural practices, or a family's income make it challenging for them to feed their child enough nutritious food to reach her full potential. With observation and tactful guidance, you can help families improve how they feed their young children. This video shows how to assess and guide a caregiver during a nutrition counseling visit, demonstrating the three steps of assessing the feeding situation, analyzing and identifying areas for improvement, and suggesting actions to help a caregiver provide better nutrition to her young child. Remember to bring your counseling cards to each visit. The pictures are a memorable visual aid for caregivers. Greet the caregiver with kindness and respect. Sit at her same level and introduce yourself. Then let her introduce herself and her young daughter, Praise. Let her know that you've come to listen and see if there are ways you can help her improve her child's nutrition. Throughout the visit, use your communication skills to establish a friendly, open rapport with the caregiver. Show genuine interest in the caregiver's thoughts by using eye contact and supportive gestures. Give her time to talk. Then, in your own words, summarize what she has said and add some thoughtful responses. Avoid using judging words and scolding gestures. Authentic communication establishes trust and trust is essential for the caregiver to believe in your suggestions and make changes in how she feeds her child. Now, assess the feeding situation. First, gather important background information by asking open questions and listening carefully to the caregiver. The counseling cards can help keep the key points in your mind. The mother tells you that Praise is eight months old. She is healthy and growing well. Praise breastfeeds frequently throughout the day and a few times at night. She now eats pap and mashed vegetables and fruits. She gets no other fluids than breast milk. Next, ask the caregiver if you may watch her prepare the meal and feed her child in her usual way. As you observe, let the caregiver know what she is doing well. This will encourage her and build her confidence. 
Watch closely so you can identify any areas for improvement. Does she follow good hygiene practices? Is the food clean? Are her hands and her child's hands clean? Though this mother washed her child's hands, she needed a reminder to wash her own. Does the mother use a variety of foods? She has a starch, a legume, and a green vegetable. But no animal source food until you find an egg. Observe how she prepares the food. Is the pap thin or thick? Does the consistency match the feeding abilities of her child? The main starch is thick enough and the vegetables are mashed well, just right for this eight month old child. How often and how much food does the mother give her child? She feeds preys about half a cup of food three times a day plus a snack. This is the right amount for this child's age. And last, how does the mother feed her child? She's patient and responsive. She waits for Prez to open her mouth before giving the next bite of food. When her child pushes the food away, signaling she's finished eating, the mother responds by setting the food down. Now, take a moment to analyze what you've learned about the child's feeding situation and identify what is going well and any areas for improvement. Think over what you've heard and seen about breastfeeding, hygiene, the variety of food, the consistency of the food, how much and how often the child is eating solid food, and how the caregiver feeds her child. And last, promote actions. Use the counseling cards to encourage discussion about the child's feeding situation. Ask the caregiver what she feels is going well and what needs improvement. Then share your thoughts with her through examples you saw that day. Start by recognizing and praising what she's doing right. Let her know that her patient and responsive approach to feeding will help Praise develop healthy eating habits. She's breastfeeding often and also feeding her child a sufficient amount of solid foods that are soft and mashed, just right for her eight month old abilities. Next, share a few practical suggestions about ways she can improve her child's feeding situation. Give her a little relevant information using simple language, but avoid lecturing to the mother. Then see if the caregiver would be willing to choose a few small doable actions to improve her feeding practices. She first offers to increase the variety in her child's diet by including a food from animal sources, such as an egg, fish, or meat in one of the child's meals each day. And second, she'd like to make a better effort to keep her child's food safe by washing her hands with soap every time before preparing food. Ask the caregiver if she has any questions and take time to respond. If needed, suggest where she can find additional support, such as a mother's nutrition group in the community. Before you leave, 
let the caregiver know that her child's nutrition is very important. You would like to come back soon to see how Praise is doing and see if there's any other way you can be helpful. Set a day and time to return. Then thank the caregiver for her time. Remember, trust is essential for the caregiver to believe in your suggestions and make changes in how she feeds her child. Establish trust through friendliness, listening well, and having genuine interest in the caregiver's thoughts and experience. In partnership with the caregiver, agree on a few small doable actions that she is willing to try to improve her child's feeding situation. Seems like some people are still coming back. So I give just a few seconds to make sure everybody's here and then have Kelsey get the screen up. So I hope that that was a really good session for all of you and that you had some good discussion thinking about how you could create your own behavior profiles and really make sure that your activities that you're um, doing with your programming really link to addressing the key factors. Um, so now we're going to talk about the third step for quality SVC, implementing and monitoring. Let's go to the next slide, please. Thanks. So we'll think back again to the Sprouts program. They now have an evidence-based SVC strategy that clearly outlines the priority behaviors and pathways linking their activities to the prioritized behaviors and their factors. After some initial planning, they were ready for implementation and monitoring. Next slide. Next slide, please. To continue to align the multiple sectors required to improve complementary feeding, the Sprouts program brought sector experts together for an initial training and periodic reflections. They also made sure that staff had all the supplies, materials, and personnel needed to carry out activities. This meant financial resources were in place for incentives for market suppliers and vendors to dry and sell fruit and small fish package for children, and personnel were available to track the supply chain and manage vendor relationships. Before starting activities, they planned trainings for frontline workers, as these are the people who interact regularly with families and community leaders and have the most important role, yet receive the least amount of training and support. The videos Ashima shared are an excellent way to strengthen skills. The Sprouts program also planned to provide intensive supportive supervision three to six months after an initial training, including mentoring and modeling to cover challenges, tools, and problem solving with change agents. Next slide. To help with quality implementation, USAID Advanced Nutrition has developed this handy do's and don'ts tool. This tool is designed as a simple way to remind all of us about good practice and implementation. You can use this resource to prepare SBC implementation plans, regularly check on implementation, and identify areas to adjust as needed in order to improve quality at every stage. In the tool, you will see this, um, some key do's and don'ts with additional details for how to follow them bulleted underneath. Let's go to the next slide. Monitoring changes in nutrition behaviors and factors on a regular basis helps programmers know how things are going and where and when to make adaptations. Because people and context shift continually, midterm and endline measures, while useful, may not be timely enough or indicate the full extent to which a program is on track. To set up their monitoring plan, Sprouts filled out this worksheet for each of their behaviors. When improvements in access to eggs stalled, they worked with local women's groups to expand sales of fish. Vendors organized parties and taste tests for young children during group meetings. Sprouts monitored implementation every three to, or six, three to six months through rapid surveys 
and review of program records and qualitative feedback. They conducted occasional monitoring visits to interview caregivers, market vendors, et cetera, to track trends in performance metrics, including any change or lack of it observed in the priority behaviors and factors. They discussed monitoring data with their implementation team every few months to understand trends and decide on changes needed to the strategy, activities, materials, or partner relationships. SPRATS had several options for sharing data with the communities, such as through a dashboard, scorecard, visual tracking tool, or community dialogue. They used community dialogues to share and discuss findings with communities and participants, so they understood and could use the findings as they saw fit. This collaboration also helped SPRATS contextualize trends and gather recommendations for adaptations. For example, as part of monitoring, they held community consultations during which they found out that caregivers had concerns about negative judgments by extended family members and neighbors about feeding children eggs due to food customs. They used community dialogues and other communication activities to address these concerns. Next slide. USAID Advancing Nutrition developed a tool to help with this step as well. After you've prioritized behaviors, conducted research, analyzed the findings, and prepared the SBC strategy, Use this monitoring tool during design and implementation to determine which priority behaviors and influencing factors to monitor as you prepare the MEL plan. The tool helps SBC and MEL staff select and apply monitoring methods, analyze results, and make adaptations. Um, this document will be added to the tool's webpage when it's finalized. We don't have the link available just quite yet. So there are two key messages that I want you to remember from this section. The first is carrying out and managing high quality interventions or activities to improve complementary feeding based on the pathway analysis um, in your SBC strategy is very important. The second is that the monitoring plan um, will help you track progress and know where and when to make adjustments. So now we have just a brief activity, which is actually just a couple of poll questions. So let's go to the next slide. Uh, and if we can put up this poll question. So is it possible to monitor changes in behaviors between large surveys? What do you think? So it looks like we had yes, not sure. One no. So yes, it is in fact very important to monitor um, behavior for monitors and factors so you know where and when to make adjustments. You can do this through methods such as peer group reports, records from community agents, consultations with communities, and focus group discussions. So you don't have to do a full survey to be able to monitor in between um, your large surveys. You just want to make sure you're getting the pulse. So then for the next one, I want you to type into the chat, what challenges have you faced when you've tried to monitor behaviors and factors? Budget. See, that's always, budget is always and time frame. These are, they, these are definite challenges. Um, Absence of an SBCC strategy. Yeah, when you don't have a strategy, social desirability response, human resources, COVID. Yep, COVID has definitely made things harder. Um, so this is where you resistance from community members. So you wanna try and address these challenges as they come up um, and really try to make sure that you are in fact monitoring um, your factors and your behaviors as you go. So I, we go to the next slide. So now I'm going to pass it off to Silver to share an example with us. Uh, thank you very much, Laura. Um, a very good morning and good afternoon to you, wherever you are. Uh, welcome to my presentation. Uh, my name is Silver Karumba. I work with USID Rwanda as a nutrition specialist. Um, with this session, I'm going to be talking about um, using SBC or social behavior change to improve children diets in Rwanda, uh, where we'll go deeper looking at the challenges we face 
uh, what are the strategies, opportunities, and uh, at the end, I will be able to share with you uh, some of the summary results uh, from this uh, uh, behavior change program. Next. Next. Uh, yes, uh, before I go into the approaches we are using, I just wanted to uh, share with you this chart to see uh, the nutrition status of, of children under five in Rwanda, uh, where we see uh, the overall 33% of children under five years are stunted. Uh, the only good news to share here is um, uh, wasting is low, uh, 1%. Uh, perhaps that's something in Rwanda we are trying to celebrate because uh, if you have ba double burden, then it becomes an issue for the undernutrition. So if you look at this chart, you see uh, we've been talking about complementary feeding or child diets. Um, problem starts starting, you can see in the shaded chart here, um, stunting starts to emerge once we introduce complementary feeding. So there's something really wrong when you look at this chart in Rwanda that uh, at six months up to 23 months, that's when you see high levels of stunting emerging. Uh, and that's when we are introducing uh, complementary feeding. Next. Yes, uh, let's first look at the challenges we are facing uh, when it comes to children diets. Uh, number one is uh, poor feeding practices. Um, the food choices mostly people prefer uh, cereals and tubers in Rwanda. Uh, I think that is also has been an intergenerational uh, preferred food, uh, which they think is the best for the children as well. Uh, poor trends for the minimum acceptable diet indicator uh, for the children in 623 months. Uh, you can see that since 2010, uh, it has been 17%, we just moved a bit uh, to 18% in the last five years. Now we have just moved to 22% um, in 2020. So you can see that the trend is a positive, but very low, very small gain. Next. Uh, another challenge we, we face in a country is uh, the consumption of animal source foods in Rwanda is low. As you can see here that only 4% consume eggs. Um, children, uh, meat consumption, 17%. So generally you could see that there is low data diversity at all ages. And uh, something to make out here is that cost also implication. Uh, you know that nutritious foods are generally expensive, especially the protein and not affordable to many. Next. Yes, when you talk about nutrition, of course, it has to go hand in hand with uh, hygiene practices, uh, wash practices. Uh, these are some of the statistics to show that 27% of the households use an improved source of water, uh, which is considered unhealthy. And 12% uh, of children under age of five had diarrhea. And you know that diarrhea disease interferes with uh, nutrients absorption. Next. You know, sir, with our programs with USAID, um, we have an, an integrated nutrition uh, social behavior change program uh, that we came up with some of the approaches that we want to share with you, how we managed to try to tackle the issues around complementary feeding. So number one is um, we are using voice messaging and we want to be really innovative how we deliver these messages. So we are using uh, voice messages that are really tailored to improve the complementary feeding. For example, uh, frequency, you've been talking about this during the breakout sessions, uh, the amount, thickness, variety, and also hygiene. And these messages targets mothers and caretakers, uh, most of those who have uh, affordable phones. And the good thing with these messages is that uh, uh, those who have the phones, the mothers can play back the voice messages for their convenience. Next. We are also trying to tap into uh, village nutrition schools uh, where we do most of the monthly growth monitoring and promotion. Uh, Rwanda has really high attendance levels uh, for the children and mothers coming every month for the nutrition schools. So we take advantage of that. And then we do uh, growth monitoring and promotion, nutrition counseling, uh, we screen my nutrition, we do the cooking demonstrations, and also we use the village role models 
and other positive deviants uh, who have been able to really uh, do or promote a very good complementary feeding. So we have these mothers learning from these peers that have been doing a great job in terms of uh, uh, complementary feeding. Next. Yes, uh, we tried also to bring in the element of the community savings and lending groups, uh, using these groups as an entry point to promote uh, children diets uh, and reduce undernutrition at the project level. I just wanted to make sure that uh, this looks at the project level. The gains you make out of these saving groups is to ensure that they are promoting uh, some money that they gain from these groups, they use it for buying nutritious foods for the children. But I just want to make a clear point here that reducing malnutrition requires multi sector investments. You need to have to really have the market access. You need to be having functional food systems. The policies, the environment should be really conducive. So I just want to highlight this, that uh, whatever you do with the saving groups is targeting programmatic level, which at the end of the day also mothers are able to gain because they're using the funds to buy uh, nutritious foods. Next. Uh, in, in the breakout sessions, we talked about the small doable actions. Uh, we are doing the same as well here with our program. Uh, we are trying to see how we involve the fathers, how we involve the mothers, try out a new behavior. If it is um, uh, consistency, uh, embark on that consistency to make sure that the porridge, if it's a porridge for the children, they are feeding the child is really consistent. And also we are trying to have the reminders. Uh, for example, uh, our program has been uh, providing these uh, ring clocks as a reminders for the mothers um, who are feeding children six to three months. So it, it rings and remind the mother that, okay, after three hours, now you're going to be feeding your child. What we have realized that um, you need to avoid too much information at the same time, uh, because uh, that would overwhelm uh, the mothers or the caretakers who are caring for the children. You just need to select just a few messages per session to make sure that they are able to really understand them and also be able to practice them. Next. Yes, we are also taking the advantage of the community radios. Uh, most rural Rwandans have uh, uh, these small radios. So you target this audience uh, using the the tool they mostly use, uh, for example, uh, the radios. We also have like um, the announcements targeting the markets, uh, these communal markets where people come to buy food. Uh, so you have these announcements made. So we are taking advantage of those to make sure that uh, we use these channels to promote um, complementary feeding for the children. Next. So, uh, for the interest of the audience, uh, I have this slide um, as an advantage uh, for us who are trying to promote complementary feeding in Rwanda, that we have opportunities uh, around this high exclusive breastfeeding rate in Rwanda, which creates really a great foundation uh, to a child's good health start. Uh, for example, uh, in our country, exclusive breastfeeding is culturally supported in the country. So you could see some of these behaviors that are supported by culture, they achieve really great results. So we are now also trying to explore what could be the current supportive culture norms around complementary feeding as well, which at the moment, uh, the culture around complementary feeding is not really doing well. Because as I said in the beginning, there are certain foods we think are the best for the children. So if you have a behavior change program, you really need to focus on this area. Next. So I have a summary of um, indicators here uh, that I got from our program, uh, the USAID Integrated Nutrition SBCC and WASH project that was implemented by CRS. It was a 24 million US dollars uh, between 2015 and 2020. So what did you achieve? You can see that indicator number one, uh, women consumption of animal source foods uh, from baseline was 16, peaked to 29% at the end line last year. 
So if we compare in the 80 districts that we supported this program, you can see that we perform better than the current national 17%. Indicator number two, uh, households with home gardens increased from 31% uh, to 50%. You know that the household home gardens are also contributing to the data diversity and the needs of children. Exclusive breastfeeding, very high, um, as I said, in the country, 86% uh, at the baseline, but the program did even better to move it to the 94% in these 80 districts. Uh, the minimum acceptable diet, which I said is a challenge uh, for children six to three months, increased from six to 29%, and also the households uh, soap and water at hand washing stations also improved. So you can see uh, generally the performance of this project was good because this program was integrating um, nutrition, social behavior change, and all these wash interventions. So I would say at the project level, USAID was able to contribute uh, something tangible in Rwanda uh, over the last five years. And um, next, yes, that's it. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Over. Great, thanks, Silver. That was a wonderful presentation. Um, so now we're going to switch gears to question and answer. Um, so thank you all for your attention to this point. Um, and actually, I'll go ahead and turn on my camera. Um, and if I don't, I haven't seen too many questions come in the chat. So I do encourage you to add your questions to the chat as you think of them. Um, but it looks like there was one that came out of the breakout room. Um, that um, was, a, this is for Ashima or Laura, um, that addressing the availability and affordability of foods in markets can often be very challenging. So do you have any suggestions for activities around that? So I'll jump in and then I'll hand it off to Ashima. But I think that it depends on the context of your program um, as to what you can do about that. In some of our programs, we really, like we can't address the affordability um, or availability of food in the markets. And what we need to look at is what is available and affordable and would also help achieve the nutrition goals. Um, so maybe, maybe it's not that, that eggs aren't available, um, but that we can look for what are some other protein sources that might maybe little fish powder and that can be grounded to powder is. Um, so it's really thinking about what makes the most sense in that program, um, depending on what the scope of the program and whether you can address, because addressing, addressing availability and affordability is a much broader focus, um, and that particularly from an SBC perspective, SBC is not going to address um, availability or affordability. And so we can't expect SBC alone to change that. And so you really need to work with colleagues in other areas to design interventions um, that will have that input. But if you can't, then you look at what are the behaviors that are doable and are reasonable in that area. Um, and Ashima, if you've got anything to add. Thank you, Laura. I think you just said it all. And, and just to reinforce and guide people, and I'll share in the chat, we undertook um, an exercise with GAIN to assess the affordability of the local foods in selected countries in Asia and Africa. And that exercise proved quite useful for uh, the countries to understand, as exactly Laura was saying, to, un to identify the foods which are nutrient rich as well as affordable in the context of the country and then link it to the um, um, social and behavior change communication efforts. So, uh, I will share the the link to that um, uh, initiative which was taken in the two regions. Uh, that may be helpful. And uh, as as Laura guided us, it's also important to when we design. That's why we say just SBC programs cannot work in isolation or should not work in isolation. So there have to be interventions to improve the availability and. Um, uh, the affordability and as I, as I mentioned about linkages with the social protection platforms is one of the options where we talk about affordable food but at the same time we also need to work through the food systems to make sure what are some of the actions across the different levels of food system we can take to make sure what is available in the market 
is um, is nutrient rich um, and affordable. So there's a there's a huge. Uh, um, I mean, this can be a detailed discussion, uh, which I don't want to go into right now. But I think that that's where we can land for now. Um, yeah, thanks. Great, thanks, Laura and Ashima. Um, next, we have a question for Silver. Um, they, uh, Monique said, thank you for the presentation. In the indicators, we see um, increase in home gardens. How do these translate into consumption, um, of avoiding commercialization, especially in households where men make the decisions? Uh, thank you, good question. Um, in Rwanda, um, using kitchen gardens or home gardens, uh, these are really small gardens that are around the household or the homestead. So the, the produce that comes out of these uh, gardens are used specifically for home consumption because the messages are designed that once you have these uh, 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 harvests, make sure that you use some of the, the, the harvests to feed the children. So I agree with you that uh, sometimes this can, the food products from these gardens can be sold, but uh, we ensure that we don't have a control over that, but we make sure that we have the messages uh, given to these households that are promoting these kitchen gardens. And perhaps at the end of the day, they're going to be using these produce uh, to feed their children. Great, thanks, Silver. Um, so we have another question in the chat from Elnia. Um, and the question is, based on your experience, so this is for all of the speakers, how long, um, or maybe we'll start with Laura, how long do you need to prepare um, to develop the SBCs, uh, the SBC program, and which stakeholders do you approach first so that um, the SBC will be effective and impactful? So in terms of how long to develop an SBC program, it really depends. Um, if you're working really fast, maybe in a few weeks, you can have it all together um, and planned for, especially for a smaller program. Um, you could probably even within, if you're hundred percent focused on that and have everybody engaged from the start, probably have a plan um, a few weeks later. If it's a really large complex program with many stakeholders that need to be engaged, it's probably gonna take you a number of months to get everything pulled together and have everyone's buy-in and agreement. So it really, there's no one size, like it always takes this amount of time. Um, so really in your context, the bigger and more complex it is, the longer it's going to take, the smaller, more narrow, more focused um, it is, then the faster you can even um, pull it together. But really in terms of stakeholders, it's thinking through who who has who has power in that area and who might be interested in what you're doing. Um, so you want to engage community leaders um, from the very start because if they feel that they were part of the design, they're far more likely to be supportive and really encouraging of your interventions. Um, so some of the stakeholder engagement isn't just to get feedback on what you're doing and improve it. It's really to make sure that people are supportive of what you're doing and help you succeed. Um, because even if they're not hurting you, if they're not helping you, you're not going to get as far. And so the specific stakeholders are going to be dependent on the context, but really think about who who, who do the people who you're trying, whose behaviors you're trying to change, who do they respect? Um, and who has the power in the community and the area, as well as who has the technical knowledge that you're trying to get. Like often the Ministry of Health um, is a key stakeholder and they have such rich knowledge of the areas where we work, of the context, of everything, um, in addition to having power and being an influencer. So of course you'd want to include them, um, but really thinking through who else is gonna be dependent on the activity. Great, thanks, Laura. Um, so next we have a question around engaging family. So um, any of the speakers are welcome to jump in. Um, but uh, Naomi says, here in Nepal, the formative research on dietary change for pregnant women shows that engaging family is key. Um, so they've developed a counseling approach engaging family members. Do you think this is needed for IYCF or is just engaging caregivers enough? Um, 
can try to answer this <laughs> and then Laura or Silver or anyone can jump in. If I understand the question correct. So the question is that um, the counseling approach, you're saying that uh, it already involves the family members, but when you say, do you think this is needed to um, for IYCA for just engaging caregiver is enough i don't i'm not able to dissociate the two the reason is uh, as to reiterate once you identify which behavior so there is a behavior prioritization which you have done but then you also have to identify who influence that that behavior so based on once you do and understand who all be it the family or the community or even someone uh, through be it social media, be it uh, your policymakers, whoever ha is influencing that particular behavior, those become your stakeholders. So, and and uh, that's what will be my response. So it applies to IYCF, it applies to any behavior you wish to change. So since we are talking with respect to IYCF, I would say any uh, anyone who is able to influence the child feeding decisions should be part of your um, SPC approach or behavior, I mean, the interventions which you will design. Great, Thank thanks Ashima. Laura, do you have anything to add? I mean, I think I agree with everything Ashima said. Um, it really, you want to engage everyone who's going to have an influence from the start and really think about what's the best way to engage them. Maybe counseling is, maybe there's a different way that will be better. Um, so it's not, there's no one size fits all, but making sure that everybody who has an influence on the behaviors is engaged is just really, really important. Great, thanks, Laura. And I think we have time for one last question. Um, so I will ask this of Silver. Um, there's a question about resharing and explaining the link of the savings group to improving nutrition status. And if you could go into more detail about how successful that was for your project. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, thank you, Irene, for, for your good question uh, in the chat box. Uh, what I can say around that is that uh, we realize that nutritious food, especially the protein, eggs, and meat, is very expensive. Uh, so when we are using our behavior change programs, mothers are facing a challenge or the caregivers to buy these food commodities. So what we did was to have these saving groups because uh, mothers have a a very identified group of around between 15 and 20 people. So these women meet every month and then they save a given amount of money every month. So by the time they are turns, they have really saved a very good amount of money and they use that. We have a message embedded into this that the money you save, have some that to buy uh, nutritious foods, for example, eggs for your children. So the behavior change approach has to go with affordability. So that's when we thought of bringing these, um, uh, the saving groups because the women are saving this money and they get uh, enough to really buy the household needs, but also have save some money for buying the, um, these nutritious foods. As I said, uh, nutritious foods is very expensive. So we have a message uh, tied into these saving groups. Thanks. Great, thanks, Silver. Um, there's one more really interesting question, so I just wanted to ask this, but really briefly, Laura, and then if you could do your key takeaways. Um, it's about how long you promote a priority behavior before you move on to the next one. And they're saying they're, um, D. Rafa said they experienced some sort of boredom from the visited households as um, the same behavior is being discussed during successive visits. So I'll let you cover that and then go right into key takeaways if you don't mind. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to go to households over and over and just keep talking about the same thing, of course people get bored, because I would. Um, that's normal. And so how do you look at it in a different way? And have your counselors, when they go back, they don't go through the same information that they shared before. They ask, how is it going? Have you tried things? What challenges are you facing? And so it's not about the amount of time promoting the same behavior. It's about shifting how you do it. And starting with the, ex the expectation that people know what this behavior is now because you've already talked about what it is and why it's important um, and made the linkages, but 
but really working with them on what are the challenges because they may face new challenges. Maybe you work with them to break through one challenge and then kids change. We know as babies, like week to week, everything's totally different. Um, so if they're trying something, maybe one week the child loves mango and then two weeks later, the child decides they hate mango. It's very possible and very common. And so you want when they go back that they're not just promoting the same behavior, but they're really individualizing, personalizing, and talking about that family's barriers and how they can work through them. Um, so that's, yeah, but I think that's, or we see a lot of projects that go back and just share the same information. And that's not, people are gonna get bored, of course. Um, so let's go on to the next slide and go into the key takeaways, because I think we've got like about one minute left, so I'll go really fast. Um, so we know complementary feeding is very complex. Why, what, how much, how often, and with what help a child should eat must evolve to meet his or her changing needs um, as he or she grows. And high quality SBC is essential for improving children's diets in the complementary feeding period. Um, existing tools and resources such as those we've shared today can help. And we wanna make sure that quality SBC is focused on prioritized behaviors which are realistic and specific to people's context, that it addresses the most important factors that influence nutrition behaviors, that it has linked pathways between behaviors, factors, and interventions, and that it's continually adapted to the situation. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to Hallie to close us out. Great, thank you so much, Laura, Kelsey, and the entire team for a wonderful presentation today. Um, I would like to just in alert everyone to, as I launch this poll here, um, we would love to see your feedback on this session. We're always looking to improve our sessions, so we definitely appreciate your feedback. Um, and I'd also like to just alert everyone to our uh, One More Learning Lab happening uh, today and then our research conference next week. All of the information is available on our website uh, and we really hope to see you at additional sessions next week. Um, so thanks again to this team for a wonderful presentation and to all, the, all of the participants for their great um, contributions as well. And uh, with that, uh, thank you so much for joining. <laughs>